But Marika, thank you ever so much for um, offering to uh, talk to us today about your research. Um, if you want to take it away and uh, share your screen now, um, that would be brilliant. How's that going? Let me see. Yeah, is Fantastic. this working? Uh, I can see that you, yep, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Looks great, thank you. So good evening, everybody. Um, for me, it's um, 6.30 now. Uh, I'm in, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, and for you, it's uh, one hour uh, earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, with this invitation to talk tonight about uh, psychosocial aspects. As you can hear, I'm not a native speaker. Uh, I'm from Holland. So uh, I apologize for my English and please let me know if it's hard to understand. Um, after this presentation, there is enough time for questions as well. I work as a clinical psychologist in uh, Amsterdam University Medical Centers. Uh, I work in the, in the pediatric pulmonology team and my focus is on um, cystic fibrosis, asthma, and uh, PCD. And I did my PhD project four years ago um, about uh, psychosocial aspects of asthma in children with asthma and also caregivers and siblings. And then after that, I focused more and more on CF and um, since two years also on PCD. And what I noticed is that there's a lack of uh, there, yeah, there is, is a lack of, of uh, knowledge and studies uh, regarding the psychosocial aspects of PCD, because um, we know it already from asthma and CF is coming more and more, but um, we really need more expertise on the on PCD. So I hope um, uh, I can improve this this um, this knowledge today, and um, we need each other as well, because my first question. Uh, I have no conflict of interest. My first question to all of you is, uh, what are the psychosocial aspects for you as a PCD patient or as a parent or, um, or a sibling? And maybe you can think about this already. And at the end of the presentation, I will ask you this again, and maybe you're willing to share this. Um, and maybe we can find out what, what of things are, uh, yeah, the, the most important topics we, we all share. Um, but for, first of all, I will explain you what we see in, in clinical practice. Today we can focus on problems like anxiety and depression, but we can also focus on, on strengths. And it's very important uh, to have enough resilience. Uh, we know from people with chronic illnesses that they have a lot of resilience. Sometimes they have more resilience than um, healthy populations. And this is very important um, in the positive psychology as well. I think it helps people more to focus on the positive things and the way they can bounce back from stressful situations. But there are high rates of depression and anxiety. And this is a study in cystic fibrosis. I will show you the results because this is, was a very large study of, in 2014, the TIDE study. And they included more than 6,000 CF patients and parents. And what we see is that adolescents um, show already a high prevalence of depression. So 10% of them showed elevated, clinically elevated scores of depression and 22% showed elevated scores of anxiety. And all these rates were two to three times higher than the community prevalence. And in this study sample, uh, you can also see that the adults score even higher. So the adults with CF have even higher scores on anxiety and depression. And um, the parents as well and mothers show more depression scores and more anxiety scores than fathers. So this was over the whole, whole uh, group. And um, there were also a lot of differences per country. They included um, uh, count of um, European countries, but also uh, the USA. But based upon 
this course, they decided to create guidelines. And um, at this moment, we are working with these guidelines all over Europe and also in the US. And I show you this because um, it can be um, maybe it, it can be a good idea in, in the future um, to do the same program and to implement the same guidelines for PCD. But at this moment, uh, we are not that far yet. Um, but of course, the diseases are sometimes comparable. Um, so I, I really would like to show you these guidelines. And um, in these guidelines, we have to screen all caregivers of a patient with CF and all patients with CF from 12 years old till adulthood, we have to screen them once a year at least. And we ask them about symptoms of anxiety and depression. So we um, use two questionnaires, the PHQ-9 and the GET-7. I will show you later. And if people score in a normal range, they have a score from one till four, um, then they only need annual screening and of course they receive ongoing prevention education but if people score a little higher in a mild range they need supportive interventions and they will be rescreened next clinic visit so within three months and um, there are also people scoring in the elevated range they need need evidence-based psychological treatment like cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness um, and uh, some people also need uh, pharmacological interventions. So these guidelines, they, they will help the healthcare providers like the psychologists, but also doctors. Um, and they will prevent people from more problems like anxiety and depression. This is the questionnaire for depression. It's based upon nine questions you can fill it in in maybe five minutes very very fast and uh, we ask people over the last two weeks how often they have been bothered by any of the following problems like little interest or pleasure in doing things or feeling down depressed or hopeless um, you can fill it in by yourself maybe after this presentation and if you have a score from one till four zero till four then you are in a normal range and if you have a score from five till nine it's a little elevated it's in a mild range and a score from 10 or higher needs more attention so this is only a screening questionnaire it's not a diagnosis of depression but it's only screening of the last two weeks so that's important to know that we don't um, tell people uh, you have a depression but it's only screening for symptoms of depression and then we can um, offer them uh, deliver them uh, the right interventions at that moment this is screening questionnaire of anxiety the get seven uh, it consists of seven questions like worrying too much or having trouble relaxing, being so restless, becoming easily annoyed or irritable. And this questionnaire is like the last, the, the other questionnaire, the PHQ-9, it's uh, validated in all languages in all countries all over the world. So that's why we decided to take these two questionnaires. Um, and it's these questionnaires are developed for healthy people, um, but of course we can use it also for people with a chronic lung disease. And um, it's the same like the like the other question that you can fill it in by yourself. And if you have a score from one till four or zero to four, um, it's in a normal range. But how to cope with a heavy burden like PCD? We wanted to know that how our population in the, C the PCD center in the Netherlands was coping with that. We have a well, pretty large uh, population in Amsterdam. Um, we also have a small town close to Amsterdam that's called Volendam. And in that town, it's a small city. Um, there are a lot of people with PCD living and they all visit our hospital. And there's a lot of expertise in uh, our center, in, in the Amsterdam University Medical Center. So we have a, a good, um, well, a, a big population. And we have uh, teens and also adults. Uh, but, well, we didn't actually know 
how they were doing because psychological care is not was not embedded into the team and um, it was already embedded into the asthma team and cf team but not into the pcd team so um, one and a half year ago we started uh, screening and we wanted to evaluate anxiety and depression in the dutch children and adults with pcd and their caregivers and we also wanted to know the association with health related quality of life and um, we screened them oh sorry <laughs> uh, we screened them uh, once a year uh, when they came to the clinic so they had their annual clinic visit and they had a lung function and at that moment we asked them to fill in the questionnaires for anxiety depression and quality of life and we asked them for their body mass index and lung function we used regression analysis um, to analyze predictors of anxiety and depression and here are the results. We included 72 respondents and um, there were elevated scores of anxiety and depression across all groups. So the children with PCD, um, we had um, almost 10% of clinically elevated scores. Um, and that was that were the scores of anxiety, but the children with PCD didn't score didn't show uh, depression scores. And then the adults with PCD, they had really high depression scores. So suddenly, at the age of twelve, <laughs> depression was increasing. We have to figure out what's happening in that stage of life. And then the mothers and fathers, um, here you can see also that the mothers have much more anxiety than fathers. And also they show, show more scores, higher scores of depression than fathers. The predictors of anxiety and depression in our group were uh, for the children were treatment burdens. So children with a lot of um, uh, problems with their treatment high treatment uh, burden they uh, showed more anxiety and depression and the adults with pcd that was a group of 26 persons um, they uh, the anxiety and depression were associated with physical functioning emotional functioning role functioning vitality and health perceptions and for the caregivers of children the associations were low bmi and symptoms of anxiety in their child so if their child has a low BMI, um, in, in a lot of cases, the, the parents showed more depression. But we only have these first results. And of course, we need more studies and we need to find out um, how this is working. And uh, also we need to find out how we can help them more. Um, but this is the first study investigating anxiety and depression in this population and, the, and also for the caregivers. And um, the study uh, showed elevated levels of anxiety and depression, uh, which were associated with worse health related quality of life. So there is a need for psychological support. And today I would like to focus more on psychological support and um, maybe you will recognize things in your own life. Um, what are the topics? So um, because I'm I'm a researcher uh, for one day a week <laughs> and the other days in the week I'm a I'm a clinical psychologist. So uh, I have a lot of talks with parents and, and children and um, I also try to improve care uh, also by writing articles and publications. Um, and this is also from another publication uh, in 2018. And um, there we mentioned all the topics and we said, well, um, a lot of people 
uh, feel a, a, a huge impact of the disease in daily life. So a topic is also um, on self-management, uh, adherence. It has also to focus on work, school, life, leisure, balance, and social family support. But um, besides focusing on problems, we also have to focus on the strengths. And if we talk with parents, um, most of the time, um, well, we focus on, on developing self-knowledge, uh, emotional acceptance and grow, uh, personal resources to empower caregivers, um, of course, resolving specific problems, but also making decisions coping with crisis and exacerbations or hospitalizations and parental parental support in day-to-day -day care and parenting at home and working through feelings. In our team, we have um, psychologists, but also social worker. I don't know how it is organized in the UK, um, but in our team, we work together. And most of the times the social worker um, is counseling parents and um, the psychologist is, is counseling or uh, giving treatment to the, to the children and the teens. It's important, as I told you at the start of the presentation, it's very important to, to focus on resilience and how to build resilience. Uh, resilience is the ability to bounce back from a stressful circumstance and it's it's important to face difficult life circumstances. Um, they are there and it's sometimes hard to deal with this disease and hospitalizations. Um, but it's also important to care for your own physical, emotional and spiritual needs. And that improves overall mental health. And that's also what we know from studies, but we know it also from our talks, of course, with parents. And it's it's no problem if it's it's a small step, because even the smallest steps um, can give another direction. We also build a plan for self-care with a lot of parents. Um, and it's it's sometimes it's good to build this plan uh, during times when when it's when their child is is going well. Um, they are not in a high need, but then we we can build it. We have time for that. And if there is an exacerbation or or a child has to be hospitalized, we already have this plan. Here are some examples. Um, which are very important, like to stay connected to supportive people and get enough sleep and get outdoors every day, especially now during the, <laughs> uh, the Corona times and um, the quarantine. And um, for a lot of parents, also for patients, it's, it's sometimes hard to delegate tasks to others, but it's very important. It's also important to ask for help before feeling overwhelmed and how to express your emotions or to say no and to allow, uh, time, uh, allow time for fun and relaxing and make also time for reflection and mourning. So this is a lot you can do. You don't have to do everything, but at least sometimes you can start with one step and you can create another, a new, better balance. In the care for children, there are some other aspects important. I focus most of the time uh, also on relaxation training because that has a good influence on the breathing. And a lot of children are also stressed about school because they miss a lot of school and they want to do it. Uh, some children want to do everything perfect. That's not possible. Um, so relaxation is an important aspect. Um, I also integrate mindfulness and other techniques. Um, I, I sometimes I, I give them psychoeducation about depression, how it works, and prevention. Of course, if there are, uh, if there are no problems with depression, we don't focus on this. But if they are, have already high symptoms, um, they need these, this psychoeducation and also behavioral activation, especially in times when they are not feeling well. Then it's also important to activate even in small steps 
and of course also with anxiety is the same. Um, sometimes I give uh, EMDR. Um, there are a lot of children who have trauma and trauma during hospitalizations or medical injuries, um, blood taking. Uh, so unfortunately it's still happening and um, then we give EMDR and that's going really fast. Um, uh, it helps a lot. We learn them, them uh, adaptive coping skills like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy techniques and problem solving skills to address barriers to personal goals and self-management, so, uh, also regarding taking medicines. Um, there's also well, space for grief and mourning. And um, after the treatment, it's important to maintain the positive changes. We won't forget the siblings, so the last minutes I, I would give them some attention because normally we focus on patients and also on parents, but um, in most of the cases there is a, there is a bigger family and there are also siblings. And um, if their brother or sister is hospitalized, well, of course the sibling will miss their caregivers um, and there are also a lot of siblings who really don't know the situation, they don't understand it, especially younger kids. They have a lot of uh, children like four or five years old, they have a lot of fantasy. Um, they don't always know what's going on and um, sometimes we forget to tell them what's going on with their brother or sister because there can be panic or um, um, parents are embarrassed as well, so uh, they forget the other kids at home. Um, since one year I have special talks to siblings as well, and um, most of them are struggling with it. Um, they also tell me that they sometimes they are worrying when their brother or sister is hospitalized, that they are really worrying if their brother or sister will come home. They don't know when and nobody tells them. Um, a lot of siblings, they, they want to help their parents or their brother or sister with PCD, but they really, they don't know how. Some kids feel angry, jealous, left out or guilty. There are also kids feeling guilty because they are not sick. So they really want to help their brother or sister. And the younger kids, so you can see that they are, they can cling to parents or other caregivers having um, a, a problem with their behavior, uh, doing things that they had grown out like bedwetting or having trouble with sleeping. And older kids like the teens, some kids, they want to be alone and some kids don't want to be alone. They can be easily overwhelmed. They can experience um, uh, a lot of things um, and be become more sensitive or quiet, talking back, getting into fights, having trouble sleeping, missing friends or having problems in school. So 10 very short tips for helping siblings cope is, well, be patient, give everyone time to adjust at their, in their own way and keep to everyday routines. That's very important. Um, set limits as usual and help children understand what's happening. Encourage your children to share their feelings, spend time with your other children. Well, it's easy to say this, sometimes it's really hard, um, but it's the same like the other uh, tips sheet. If you take one or two, that's, that's already, that can make a difference. Um, so help sibling, siblings feel involved, keep, help them keep in touch, encourage them to have fun and seek help. You can also seek help in the PCD team uh, with the psychologist. And we developed an online treatment program. We developed this for uh, cystic fibrosis. Uh, it's called eHealth CFCBT. And um, Next step can be that we can adapt this for patients with PCD, um, but that will be a future ideal plan, I hope so. And I think that we really need more 
online uh, therapies and interventions, especially now in this time with COVID. And it's also hard uh, for patients to visit the hospital every time. Uh, so that will be the future, I think. So the question from the beginning, <laughs> what are the psychosocial aspects for you? Um, maybe I can go to, to my last slide uh, to end this presentation and then maybe we can discuss this and you can ask questions. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank I you. also want to thank uh, the PCD team of our center and the patients and parents. Thank you so much, Marika. That was absolutely brilliant and so useful, I think, for, for loads of us. Um, yeah, definitely, I think having those tips, especially that you've put on there for parents, for people with PCD and for siblings is so important and it's going to be really useful. Um, I think, uh, what would you like to do? Would you like to qu um, kick off with some questions or go back to the slide that you showed in the beginning? Yeah, uh, for me, I'm interested in if you uh, if you recognize the symptoms, also like anxiety, depression, and um, it's also helpful if we know as healthcare providers how we can help you better. Yeah, so so I'll, let me start by giving a sort of community response, perhaps, because this is something that um, I've been talking about with a few people in the past couple of weeks. Um, so recently, the four specialist PCD centres in, in uh, the UK, they met together um, and uh, to sort of discuss the, the PCD clinics at all of those centres. And a lot of them reported um, an increase in referrals for mental health support, particularly in um, ch children and adolescent mental health. Um, and this seems to have perhaps become increased because of the uh, stresses that COVID have put on the PCD population in Britain. And we had a chat before this uh, talk kicked off, that kicked off actually, and uh, we sort of said that it seems like the, uh, the guidance and the advice for people with PCD is very different here in Britain, perhaps, to how it is in the Netherlands. Um, but certainly we know that a lot of our uh, child population experience anxiety in PCD. Um, and I think it was very, very interesting, actually, that you um, those graphs where you showed that 60 percent of mothers um, experience anxiety and depression, um, which is, seems incredibly high, doesn't it? And I did actually have a question about that, um, which was you said that a low BMI in a child was sort of linked to a higher rate of uh, depression in, in parents. And do you think this is because the child with a low BMI is more likely to have a severe illness, a, you know, severer form of PCD? Yeah, that's what we suggest. Of course, we need more studies to figure this out. But we know also from studies with other chronic lung diseases that if the condition like the FEV1 and BMI decreases, then this gives a lot of stress to parents. But it can also be the other way around. Mm -hmm. So uh, if there are a lot of problems in the family, sometimes it's hard to uh, to give them their medication in time and to help children uh, coping with the disease. So maybe the problems of the parents can decrease BMI, but it can also weigh, uh, be the other way around. But there is, a, there is a connection in this study, in this sample in Amsterdam. And if, if I may, how many were in the sample? Because you said you had quite a big population in Amsterdam and the surrounding town. Yeah, we, we included 72 patients at that moment. And after this, now we are, we included more than 100 already and we submitted the paper, but uh, at that stage we had 72. Yeah. And wow. almost everybody, everyone participated um, at the end, so. I do, I do think that um, it is, as I get older, this is from a personal perspective, as um, I can't speak from other people's perspective with PCD, but as, as I get older, I certainly do notice the kind of 
maybe that I didn't identify anxiety related to PCD before, but I'm more aware of it now. And I think it's perhaps because we're a lot more open about speaking about mental health issues and there's more information available to help people um, identify what that feeling is. Um, and actually someone else has asked a question that's similar to this and they say that, um, that as a parent, they had symptoms of anxiety before the diagnosis. The diagnosis helped and I, I think that means and I, I know a lot of parents experience this feeling where they take their child to the hospital or to the doctor and say I think they're ill and they say no they're fine um, and this happens and this happened with my own mother you know it took it can take years for people to get a diagnosis and it makes the parent or the caregiver have to make that choice between whether do they feel that they're being unreasonable um, or irrational or are they going to have to push to get that diagnosis? So I think maybe this is what um, Alison is referring to here. She says that maybe sessions on diagnosis for patients and family may help to get things on an even keel after diagnosis. Um, so I guess, do you do work in, in Amsterdam about once someone gets that diagnosis of a condition, to look at the kind of immediate psychological impact uh, on the person with PCD. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I'm comparing it um, to the patients with CF because um, when I started, we didn't have the screening for CF. So children came very late sometimes at the age of, of nine or, or at later uh, age. And now they, they all come um, uh, as a baby. And I think in the UK, it's the same. And um, parents, they, they cope different with this. Um, so the parents we, we saw at the beginning um, with older kids, they really, um, they were like relieved that, yeah, finally they got this diagnosis and um, everybody was listening to them, that there were real problems. And then we could focus as a psychologist immediately on, on how to cope with the disease. But um, in CF, when we say, uh, see the babies, um, a lot of babies are not sick. And then we have to tell them that there's something wrong and that's completely different from the beginning. Um, so um, for PCD, maybe we should focus also on, on the diagnosis and to create a program with mental health within the team. Yeah. I mean, from the charity point of view, actually, this is where we often get that first point of call with a newly diagnosed family. So a child gets diagnosed and we we are lucky that it's becoming younger and younger that people are being picked up with PCD. So they get diagnosed and then the parents are sent away with all this treatment to do. Yeah. And they're, they're, sure they're doing the treatment right. And it's a really high level of anxiety for them. And often the in we are lucky is if they are under a specialist center, the specialist centers know the charity um, quite well. And so they'll say, try talking to, to someone at PCD support, but, but it is a very overwhelming time for people. And I think certainly um, there's not a huge amount of uh, psychological support for PCD in Britain specifically. Um, and just for everyone on this call, and I will come back to asking some of the questions in a second, um, but just to highlight while, while we're on this, um, I did speak about this to the um, PCD centres the other day about the best route. And if you're having problems with your mental health, um, which happens to many people and, you know, at some point in their life, um, the advice was to contact your GP and speak to your GP as one port of call, but also to tell your PCD centre. So um, there is some, a, a small amount of funding for some um, psychological support in both the adult and the children's services and the advice was that the best way of doing this was to do both at the same time because I'm, I don't know if it's like this in Amsterdam but or in uh, the Netherlands but uh, we have very long waiting lists in Britain to get mental health support and um, as so I think we need we need this balance of things that we can do ourselves and that's why I'm really interested in talking a bit about your CBT for CF uh, resource um, a little bit later um, but we also we also need to make sure that people are getting help when they feel they need it. And I think um, especially at the moment, there's a huge amount of pressure on families with PCD and individuals with PCD in looking after their mental health um, during this pandemic. Um, I've got a really lovely uh, comment for you here, Marika. 
which says, your work gives me so much hope. My experience has been zero awareness or support from medical professionals for the mental health impacts of PCD. I'm particularly passionate about supporting children transitioning into teens and then adulthood. And this has reinforced, um, your findings have reinforced that there is an increase in depression at age 12. Um, so I think, yeah, you, uh, it's, we wanted to speak to you immediately from hearing your talk because it seems so relevant to, to PCD in Britain as well. Um, so can I ask you a uh, quick question? So one of our uh, colleagues actually said, could you just explain a little bit more about EMDR? So this was the eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. What is that? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a trauma therapy. And maybe in the, in the Netherlands, um, it's it's normalized that all psychologists have to to learn that and to do that. Um, it focuses on eye movement, so it works like this. <laughs> um, well, it's hard to explain in English. Um, Sorry. <laughs> um, because and um, uh, if we have a, a traumatic experience, um, we we are getting into the fight flight or freeze response and um, um, that's in the, in the basic of your your brain so um, if you have an, uh, you have seen maybe a, a terrible accident and um, then you have this traumatic uh, experience like um, you're sweating or you have a, a high uh, heart rate um, and then um, if you think about this again you have the same reactions in, into your body and it's very hard to to solve that by yourself. You can talk about it, but every time you're talking about it, you get more and more traumatized. So if you have this method with EMDR, um, uh, you will give, um, um, how do you say it? Uh, yeah, it's a reaction in your into your brain. So you're not brainwashed. You can talk about this experience, but you don't feel all these physical sensations anymore. And you will be become more relaxed about that. So, so it's a sort of way of reprogramming your yeah brain. yeah okay that's really yeah. interesting. I mean a lot of people with PCD and you know right from little children through to adults have had very um, intensive medical procedures and surgeries and experiences I think um, everything from I mean I, I can think of being 18 and being on uh, a ward and because I had a lung problem I was on the ward with all the old people that have old with lung problems because they're older <laughs> and um and finding that just really stressful with sort of literally um pensioners sort of dying and things and uh i think we take for granted maybe some of the things that the that the pcd community um have that can be quite traumatizing as well i know we've got a um, quite a few, and some of that, these families are on the call today. Families who've had their their children have had ports fitted, portacaths, and even that can be, you know, you have a foreign object sort of in in your body somewhere. You're aware that it's associated with maybe an increased risk in blood clots. You you're aware it has to be serviced every eight weeks. Um, so there really is quite a lot of um, unspoken sort of traumatic experiences. I think that yeah have been experienced in the PCD population. So it's really interesting that that is a potential way of dealing with it. I've got a really good question here from um, one of my uh, friends with PCD who says, um, what are the main ways of missing large amounts of school um, affecting, so how, what, what are the main ways missing large amounts of school can affect someone with PCD? And what are the effects of diagnosis at a late age with no expl explanation for their symptoms. So we've kind of got two questions here. We've got missing large amounts of school and having PCD, which I'm sure a lot of people on this call have experienced. And we've got what, what happens when you're diagnosed quite late in your age. So the first question, if you miss a lot of school, um, in a lot of teens, it gives a lot of stress and they are also missing social contacts. Um, I know a lot of children who, who really want to go to school, but then after school, they're extremely tired. So they don't have any energy uh, to see their friends or to go to sports or so. Then uh, with them, I try to to make a new schedule during the week that they maybe can take one day off 
uh, in the middle of the week and that they have some energy to do also nice positive things because that's also what you need um, in, in your life. Um, but now, especially now in, in during the uh, COVID times, uh, a lot of children have online on, uh, education from home. And then for a lot of kids, it's easier um, to, to be at school. <laughs> I mean, to be at online school. Uh, so they save some energy. Uh, so that's a positive um, influence maybe. But I can definitely relate to that. I'm studying a master's at the moment. And I did, last week I did all my lectures in bed and I just had the screen off. And I thought no one needs to know. But um, yeah, certainly I think something um, I heard a few years ago was this spoon theory. Uh, I think I'm sure you have heard it about having, you have sort of seven spoons of energy that you can use in a day and you choose how to, to use them. And if you have a chronic illness, sometimes a lot of that energy goes and just treating yourself and getting to, you know, getting up and things. So um, I, it's interesting how some of the issues with COVID have benefited people in being able to, like Katie, for example, not having to commute for four hours a day or something like that. And <laughs> she's very happy about that. But given people a bit more time for, for their energy and treatments. Um, so what about the impact of uh, being diagnosed later in life? What do you think that causes for people with PCD? Yeah, maybe the pa patients who are lately diagnosed can tell us as well, because I, I know a lot of different experiences. Okay, so um, I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer. I can see someone, I see Katie's unmuted. <laughs> I'm happy to talk. Um, so I was diagnosed fairly late, not as late as some on this call, but um, in my late teens, about 17. Um, and I struggle quite a lot at the time with, oh, well, I never had to do these treatments before and I was fine. And now I have to do all this extra stuff that I never knew about. Why? Why has this changed? And just being in complete denial that I had a problem because I didn't have to do anything before and I was fine. I wasn't fine, but felt fine. I think that takes quite a lot out of you to then go through the process of going, doing your treatments when you really don't want to do them. Whereas I think if you're a child with PCD, yes, okay, nobody wants to do the treatments. No one wants to do their physio, but you kind of get a bit more trained into it and you have a habit rather than a reluctance as maybe I did. What do you think about that Marika? Is that something you hear a lot? Uh, yeah and, and for younger kids um, it belongs to their daily life so um, if, if parents tell them you have to take these medicines then they accept it like brushing uh, their teeth or <laughs> um, and for teens it's harder. Um, and your process of, of uh, acceptance and denial, uh, it starts later. So um, I hear a lot of adults with PCD and they tell me that they, they are used to live with the disease. For them, it's normal that they don't have enough energy and they are always coughing and it's, it's normal. Um, so that process starts later. And now sometimes uh, uh, patients, they, they become uh, burnout or... Um, um, they have, have a really hard time and then at that moment very lately they realize that they also have a chronic illness. So that's really interesting because um, although I, I might not be speaking on behalf of all people that were diagnosed quite early, I was diagnosed when I was four, um, but I find it really hard to be compliant if that's the right word you know with my treatments and um, fitting it in around a full-time job and you know other commitments I find really hard and I was wondering do you have tips for people um, in terms of keeping that habit keeping that routine especially when it's something that's not interesting and it's you know a bit uncomfortable and tiring yeah there, there are a lot of medicines um, for the long-term effects and you don't feel better at that day, at that moment when you take the medicine. So that's harder. Um, and it's it's important that you that you set um, uh, the times at, in in a, in a time schedule, or you use your alarm of your um, mobile phone that you have every day. You have the same moments taking your medicines, and it's not always possible with all medicines, but with a lot of medicines, it's possible. Um, 
and we have a special program uh, also for improving adherence and um, it's also a, a process with parents and siblings and in the family how are you are you doing this um, are you doing everything by yourself or do you need help from your environment that's really interesting so we've got we're closing up on having much spare time left but i've got a couple more questions um to ask on that so um myrona lovely myrona it's it's your time you asked a question a very long time ago and i'm sorry i haven't got to it she says thank you for this great presentation marika i was wondering if you found any associations between the total score of the quality of life pcd and depression scores in your study and the second so i'll let you answer that one first and then there's a second one I have to think about that, but I, I don't remember that, that we had this total score of quality of life. We only used the domain scores. Could you just say yeah. that for um, the people on the call that, uh, you know, make that a bit clearer if possible? Yeah, this, this questionnaire, it's a wonderful questionnaire. It's developed by uh, Quitner a few years ago. And it uses different domains like physical um, uh, activation, like emotions, uh, school. Uh, so it asks for uh, yeah for your daily life and and uh, how that's going. And we used all the domains, the different domains. Okay. Um, and then the second question on here from Myrona is, um, now that some clinics are cancelled because of COVID, have you found a way to support children and their families via online meetings? And have you noticed any new psychosocial issues coming out of this kind of pandemic situation? Well, there are lots of, of very interesting questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, in our clinic, uh, I'm, I'm allowed to be there only one day a week now, one or two days a week, but uh, I also have to work from home and then um, I'm video calling with my patients. Um, and in some cases it's perfect and it works and in also some cases it doesn't work. Um, so, well, um, I think it's, um, it's better to have the the children and the teens face to face. It, uh, in my case, it works better. And especially if you have younger kids, you, you need toys and you need to, to draw and to, well, to, to use other, other things um, besides using a screen. Uh, and we have also some multi-problem families. And then uh, if I call them, um, wait, they, they don't answer these calls or video calls. So we really have to see them in, in the clinic. And it's hard to reach them um, now in this time. I suppose a really important thing <coughs> sorry, to remember is that um, PCD doesn't just happen on its own, does it? Other bits of your life happen at the same time and I guess for some people it can accumulate and and you know for some families as well PCD isn't the that's just one small thing of you know all the other problems that they face I mean we have families in the UK where there are four siblings that all have PCD and I think those you know and the stress that that must put on those parents to you know, you do four sets of physio twice a day and all the medication and the, you know, it's a lot of strain. And, and that's in addition to other strains like financial strain, if you're a main caregiver for, um, for the children and you can't necessarily work at the same time. Um, and actually someone's asked a sort of similar question to this. So we have a, a friend here from Spain, Beatrice, and um, she's 30. And uh, she says, you know, huge treatment burden and she feels a lot of anxiety um, because she spends a lot of time doing her treatments and it makes her feel um, that she's got less time for studying and less time for work. And that makes her feel inferior to her friends and peers. Um, and that, that can have quite an impact on her in terms of feeling like depressed and, and tired. Um, I'm sure that's an experience that a lot of us uh, can sort of relate to that never having enough time to do everything. Um, what's your tips for this, Marika? Yeah, thank you so much for sharing this. And um, um, it's like we were talking, uh, we, we were talking about this already because you, you have a small box of energy and then you have to decide what you are going to do. Um, so you should focus on the things which give you energy as well. 
Uh, of course, it's important to do your job and your school. Um, but if you don't have energy, then you're at risk as well uh, to, to get into a depression or um, feeling even worse. So it's, it's, sometimes it's good to, to uh, make a plan with a psychologist or, or coach or, or also with your parents. It's, it doesn't matter, but with somebody else to, um, who listen to you and uh, that you can focus on the things which are really important to you if you have only little inner energy. I, I was once given some really good advice a couple of years, well, quite a few years ago now, about five years ago. I was in a really stressful job working sort of 60 hours a week. I was not really eating lunch because I was running around. So I was losing a lot of weight and then I was getting chest infections a lot. And, you know, everything was very stressful. And it's because I felt this huge pressure to do my job as good as someone who didn't have a health condition. And um, someone, a, sort of some, a friend pulled me aside and said, the, the roof doesn't fall in because you, you take a day off or, or because you leave an hour early. It doesn't all collapse. You know, the house doesn't burn down. Um, and I, I just remember thinking how useful that felt to feel that, okay, so if I take an hour off and I leave early, who actually cares? And, and you, I mean, you have to have an ex, a, a job that will allow you to do that or, you know, but it was quite an interesting way of thinking that you know, that the world doesn't sort of sit on your shoulders and you're not responsible for everything working all of the time. And, and if you have to take some energy for yourself, then it's very important. I think um, it was definitely useful advice uh, for me um, when I was working. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people, they don't want to, to have others known that they have PCD. That's also what you are doing, like overcompensating um like i'm i'm a normal person of course you are a no normal person but you have pcd as well so how to deal with that absolutely well look i think um that's just about all we've got time for today and um those i think are most of the questions if people do have questions after this feel free to email me at the chair address um, or you can email us and contact us on social media. But can I just thank you so much, Marika? It's so interesting. And I hope that the, the profound impact of your research comes over to Britain as well and does more and more um, in our community. And just a reminder to everybody that if you are um, struggling with your mental health at the moment, please go and speak to your GP and let your PCD teams know. And it's a very normal thing that is important to deal with. Wonderful. Thank you ever so much for coming. And uh, one more thing. Um, we've been doing these talks every month and uh, next month we're going to have a Christmas party instead. So we will be, <laughs> Katie and I are a little bit nervous about this, but we will be releasing the details of this in a uh, week or so. But lastly, just thank you so much, Marika. And um, we look forward to hearing more and more of your research as the, uh, the months go on. Thank you very much, all of you, also for sharing all these experiences. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much.